This is Harney's Offshore Litigation Podcast number one. My name is Ian Mann and I am joined by my colleague here in Hong Kong, Gareth Murphy. Welcome, Gareth. Uh, hello, Ian, and hello, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> the topic is lessons learned from the fascinating recent shareholder case in the English High Court of Dinglis. Um, is that how you pronounce it? I hope so. I have to say, when I was first given a copy of the judgment, and once I got over the fact that it's <laughs> 96 pages long... Oh, no. What is going on? Modern judgments are getting just monstrous. Uh, it has its own index, which is always a, a bad sign. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but once I got over that, the, the first question was, uh, how do you pronounce this, uh, this name of this company and the name of the parties? Is it Dingles Rhymes with Shingles? Or is it, as you've said... Uh, rightly so, I believe. Dinglis. Perhaps he could tell us how, well, how you know that. Well, trust an Irishman to try and make it uh, rhyme with a place in Ireland. Um, but I have to say, I've got one over you. I actually emailed um, Daniel Lightman QC, huh. who, <laughs> who is the, who was the the silk representing the respondents, and I asked him the question just to get one over you. I asked him, how do you pronounce it? He said the name is pronounced Dinglis. A Cypriot family, after all, aren't they? So, Absolutely. Anyway, um, that's the most important thing, so we don't look foolish. You know, Daniel Lightman's actually the son of Gavin Lightman. Incredible family, but anyway, did not we know that. digress. Indeed. So, uh, what's this case all about? Well, I mean, firstly, uh, I'd like to say the judge was Adam Johnson QC sitting as Deputy High Court yeah, Judge, yeah. and we refer to him as the judge yeah, just yeah. for ease. Mm. But as he, as the judge, so eloquently described, it, the entire background to this petition begins with a catastrophic falling out between members of the Dinglis family. Yeah, that sounds like all of our Asian disputes that lead to unfair prejudice claims in the BVR came out. <laughs> yes, it certainly, it certainly sounds familiar, I think it's fair to say. Um, so the, we don't need to get into the ins and outs of what caused a catastrophic fa- falling out, although that is obviously relevant and it's set mm-hmm. out in the judgment. But I suppose it's the, the case that there was a family business, a property business based mm-hmm. in North London. Um, and the uh, uh, first named respondent, Andreas uh, Dinglis, uh, was the father. He'd set up the business mm. and he got his uh, children involved uh, to, uh, with the business, but also his children were shareholders. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul, who is the uh, petitioner, uh, and his sister Cheryl, who was a party and a, a petitioner, um, but then who reconciled with her father and was was released from the proceedings mm. and sold her shareholding to her father. So mm. it, it was remains just Paul uh, as the only petitioner. He uh, owns 12% essentially of the business. This is Paul. This is Paul, yeah, the son. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, you know, bizarrely, I mean, at one stage, because there are divorce proceedings yes. between um, Father Andreas and his uh, wife, uh, Iris mm. and then Cheryl and Paul, the two children, actually sided with with Mum for a yeah. while, didn't they? They did. Yeah. Um, so it, I mean, it's son suing father essentially. It was son, it was son suing father. But as you say, there, there was a, a, a matrimonial proceedings mm. where the two children were seemed to be on the side of the, the the wife. And then, no sooner was an order made in, in into 2015 in the matrimonial proceedings, than the father took proceedings against a number of parties, including the two children, his own two <laughs> children. Well done him. Immediately. <laughs> and and there's only been an, uh, an order in that in that case mm. in 2019. So just mm. before we get to this judgment. So that's mm. all kind of the background to, to how we get to here, you know. And I mean, the, the, the ultimate, I mean, this is only stage one in a sense because the judge is find, finds that there is unfair prejudice, yeah. some naughtiness, which I no doubt you'll tell me about. Mm. Um, but he, he, he also finds, however, contrary to the petitioner's case, that's what you call it in England, um, that it's not a quasi-partnership type company. Mm. So, I mean... This, this is only, I suppose you'd call it liability. We've got quantum next. You know. That's correct. Absolutely mm. correct. And there's issues around quantum that are discussed, but I haven't actually been decided, as you say, yeah. in relation to the date of valuation, which is mm. something that could uh, could obviously have a bearing on things, and what exactly the minority discount to be applied is. Um, as you say, quasi-partnership is a crucial part of this case. Um, and, 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 and in finding that there was uh, no quasi-partnership, then uh, a minority discount, of course, can be applied, as our listeners no doubt are aware. Uh, but listen, yeah, the, the, the minority discount is going to be a swinging great discount, mm. is it? In a case where the, 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 the shareholding is only 12%, yeah. um, Sun Paul had never had a seat on the board anyway. No. The other 80 
eight percent of yep. the shares are all held by dad mm. and so that's going to have to be a swinging great minority discussion yeah i think you're right and one other factor there mm. is that be- since the catastrophic falling out in 2012 2013 um, uh, Paul has had no involvement in the business at all yeah, and intriguingly right, 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 right. the business has dramatically improved in its fortunes since, <laughs> since dad took oh, back dear. control so oh, I do think dear. with all of those factors on board there may well be a significant uh, discount on, on the minority you know, whilst we're talking about minority discount, um, I mean, it's been very interesting to look. I mean, the, the, the general rule has been over the years that you would expect there to be a minority discount in all uh, cases where there's a, a buyout ordered, um, where it's not a quasi-partnership. But if it is a quasi-partnership, then you're not going to give a minority discount. Yeah. And um, there's a there's an odd sort of part of the judgment where mm. they sort of the judge seems to uh, D- Daniel Lightman's behest seems to sort of catch out um, the, the learned and famous uh, author and, and, and deputy judge Robin Hollington where he, he Robin seems to say things somewhat inconsistent in his mm. book with, with, with a, a decision that he himself was a, a judge in um, it called Blue Index, which mm. was a 2014. An interesting so, case, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought there was an interesting reference in his book where petitioners acquired shares as an investment without an entitlement to participate in the running of the company. The general rule is appropriate to apply a discount, mm. especially if the petitioner originally acquired the shares at a price which was discounted to reflect a minority status. Mm. And I mean, that seems to be. Uh, the case, but as you say, the judge actually looks at some interesting potential exceptions to the to the rule that we said uh, that, that that where a pro rata valuation was justified, even where there was a quasi partnership. Um, uh, it's an interesting analysis. This whole area of, of of minority discount that the judge does in his last few pages uh, of, of his judgment. I mean, um, uh, not settled yet. I mean, we, we need some sort of court of appeal. Yeah. Uh, decisions on this, yeah. really, don't we? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is probably a whole podcast just to talk about minority mm. discount, but I, I was just very interested to see how O'Neill and Phillips is mm. very well summarised yeah. by the, the, the judge as well as Ibrahimi and Westbourne galleries. Um, and I always, um, I, I can never understand why, you know, all, all these learned authors tell us that you must never categorise um, those categories which might cause there to be a finding of, of, of just an uh, of, of, you know just an equitable winding up but I, I have a bit of a theory that you can actually categorize those as, as five I mean that the first one is always deadlock yeah illegality mm-hmm. loss of substratum yeah uh, if there's a quasi partnership company found, yeah. and then oppression now I just remember those I just rattle them off because if you pull that together that's that that has an acronym. It's, it's called DISCO. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> very, very good. And there were certainly appear to be have been some uh, some 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 shapes thrown about in this in this case. If you if you pardon me using that expression, um, I thought there really was an excellent. I agree with you. An excellent analysis of the the the, the key judgments, uh, O'Neill and Phillips in particular, yeah. um, and and the difference between you know when when you have a and this I think is is interesting where you have a clear understanding between the parties. Mm. beforehand in terms of a quasi partnership mm. and where you just have a kind of an expectation that a party has mm. and while a party is entitled to an expectation well, it's not the same yeah well that, i mean you 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 essentially talking about a contract that you know there's no basis for a bargain and yeah. this this you know we're warned aren't we yeah. um in O'Neill and Phillips by um Lord Hoffman that yeah. you know be careful with his expression legitimate expectation because just because one party wants it in fact the case only <laughs> doesn't yeah. mean both parties have agreed you've oh. got to show an agreement and reliance you I, know? I, Absolutely. Um, um, I, I think it, it's worth actually at this stage uh, of the podcast, perhaps just you know summarising the findings and the issues that arose in this case, so that people can can uh, you know really get their teeth into this case themselves, because there's just so much in here. That obviously, we just don't have time to talk about today. But ultimately, there was a finding of no quasi partnership after yeah. an excellent analysis yeah. of all the case law on that. Yeah. There was a finding that. There was therefore no unfair prejudice for breach of the understandings, mm. but there was unfair prejudice for breach of fiduciary duties. Yeah. So how those two interrelate mm. is interesting. Mm. And then minority discount because no quasi partnership. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
and dad essentially wasn't looking after company money properly I mean yes and yeah absolutely yeah. so listen um, that's our time that's the 10 minutes um, I, I hope you'll agree to appear again uh, for the same appearance fee uh, which is nothing I well we'll be no. consistent then <laughs> oh, great <laughs> thanks so much thanks for listening